to hike a mountain and look for his sheep. Someday he's going to grow up and do that. Brett has a prejudice. <laughs> it's about physical exercise and effort. So Brad, he does a, he believes in exercise. He does half a setup in the morning and the other half at night. <laughs> He's, his, his philosophy in life is that God only gave me so many steps, I'm not about to waste them. <laughs> and so this is about as much exercise as he really wants to do. <laughs> that and combs his hair and straightens up his tie. So we're going to talk... <laughs> Okay, let's, let's start over. <laughs> so today we're talking about, we're continuing this series in new birth and what does it look like. And today we're talking about the fact that God invites everybody to the table. And as we talk about that, as we look at this passage, we're going to be looking at from Acts chapter 10, we see that Peter had to deal with various aspects of his life to do the outreach that God has called him to, to reach out to people around him. And so we're going to be, if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to Acts chapter 10, in Acts chapter 10, we're going to read this passage, and, and when we get done reading, just keep your Bible open because we're going to come back to it. We're not going to finish, read all of it to start with. But in this passage, Paul has to, or Peter has to deal with his prejudices and how he sees the people around him and how he sees the people that God has called him to reach out to, starting with verse 1 of chapter 10. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout, God-fearing, and he gave generously to those who had need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were in the journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and popped, stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, Three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to the house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met them and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that you should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I sent, so when I sent for... So when I sent for... I came without raising any objections. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now that we are all here in this presence of God, listen to everything that the Lord has commanded you. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So in this passage, Peter is given this vision about coming and ministering to a Gentile, someone that was a centurion, this is Cornelius, and he was called to come to Cornelius' house and talk to someone that was really different than him. So let's 
Think about who Peter was. Peter was a devout Jewish person. Peter was a follower of Jesus Christ. He was a guy that held to and followed the Jewish traditions and the Jewish laws. He, he was very respected in the Jewish community. And God is calling him to go to Cornelius, who is just the opposite in every way. And here's what we know to start with. For us to invite people to the table, we have to come to grips with our prejudices. What are the prejudices that you have in your own life? Like, I like to think I don't have a lot of prejudices, but I have a prejudice when it comes to food. I'm not eating some things. Like, sweet potatoes, they're not of God. I don't want to eat them. Watermelon, it's not, it's another one. It's a weed. Look in the garden. It's nothing but a weed. If you want food, you should eat food. If you want to drink water, you should drink water, but you don't need to try and combine the two, right? So watermelon, not of God. There are some other things that are really not of God that we, that we try and do. You know, like there are, there are, there are places that we don't go. We, we learn things. Like when I was a little kid, I grew up in a sale barn and, and all these livestock truckers would come in there. And I'm telling you, no offense to truck drivers, but livestock haulers are not the cream of the crop, okay? And, and, and so I learned things and phrases and saw things, that, you know, that kids shouldn't see. And so one of the phrases I learned when I was a little kid was a phrase about prejudices. And the phrase was this. I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't associate with those who do. Has anybody ever heard that phrase before? That's a phrase that talks about prejudices. And, and Peter had a prejudice. So Peter did not really like the idea in his mind of going to visit Cornelius, the centurion. So let's think about this. Cornelius lived in, a, in Caesarea. Caesarea was the capital of the Roman invasion of the Jewish community. And so everything about Caesarea was everything against what the Jewish people liked. They didn't want anything to do with Caesarea. Cornelius was a part of the military. The military abused and mistreated the Jewish people. Cornelius was everything that Peter was against as a Jewish person. And so Peter has this vision. He has this vision of this food coming down. So I've often read this passage. I said, God, this would be a great passage to preach about. It says, get up, kill, and eat. Dude, that's my philosophy in life, you know, like... I mean, why, look at a guy my size. I obviously haven't missed too many kill and eat situations. And, and, and so I thought, you know, God, I can preach about this passage and we'll talk about food. I mean, the only bad food are things that I don't like or they're not cooked properly, you know? So steak, if it's overcooked, give it to Brad. Uh, if, if it's undercooked, you know, I'll take it. But, but we all have prejudices. And so Peter had to deal with his prejudice against the Gentiles. This Roman centurion, this guy who was a part of the military regime that abused and mistreated the Jewish people. And as I read this past, I had to ask myself the question, who, what are my prejudices, really? I mean, like, if someone comes up to you and starts talking to you, and they're covered in tattoos, and they have piercings all over their body in places you didn't even think there could be piercings, or if they're wearing clothes that you don't think even resemble clothes or look right, or if they have these funky hairdos with hair colors that you didn't even know existed, like maybe the color of their hair is that of a mad rooster, maybe, maybe they got things coming out of their, their sound system, music playing that don't even resemble music at all. Do you feel a kindred spirit with them? Do you feel like talking to them? And the reality is, is we oftentimes prejudice against people because of their age, because of their skin color, because of their gender, because of their sexual orientation, because of their nationality, because of where they work, because of what they talk like, or how they look, or how they're educated. The list can go on and on and on, and we can find ways to be prejudiced against people. But it's not what God calls us to. And so in this passage, Peter is confronted by his prejudices. And so before Peter ever goes to meet with Cornelius, so let's think about Cornelius. Cornelius, it says, is a, is a devout man. He's a God-fearing man. He's not a believer yet at this point, but he fears God. He prays to God. He's respected in the Jewish community, but he doesn't have that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He hasn't been anointed by God. And so God comes to Peter and he says, Peter, I want you to go to Cornelius. But before I can get you to go to Cornelius... You need to become converted yourself. And Peter's conversion was not to Christianity. Peter's conversion was to the possibilities in Jesus Christ. And that is one that many of us have to wrestle with on a regular basis because it's easy for us to get prejudices 
against people that don't think like me, that don't act like me, that don't look like me, that don't smell like me, that don't drive what I do. I mean, like, we could go on and on and talk about the things that prejudice us against people. It's easy to turn someone away because they don't look like me or act like me or think like me. I mean, it, it, it's just a struggle that we have to face on a daily basis. Mahatma Gandhi, he shared in his autobiography that in his student days in England, he was deeply touched by reading the Gospels and seriously considered becoming a convert a convert to Christianity, which seemed to offer a real solution to the caste system that was in India at that time. He decided one Sunday that he should attend a church service and ask the minister for some enlightenment on salvation and other doctrine. So when Gandhi got to the church, he entered the sanctuary, but the ushers refused to give him a seat, and they told him he should go elsewhere and worship with his own kind of people. And he said in his book that he left and he never went back. And then he said this. He said, if Christians have caste systems or caste differences also, why should I leave the Hindu religion? And for all of us here today, we have to deal with our prejudices because there are probably people that you're not always real comfortable with. And, and I'm not going to point them out to you. I'm not going to even try and p- point out the people that I've had to deal with. But in my own life, I've had to wrestle with it. So I grew up in a very, very small community in Iowa. I lived south side of the track, south side of the town, last house on the south side of the street. We were the nobody people. We were down there south of the sale barn, south of everything. But our little town was about that big. You know, there was maybe... 1,250 people in the town growing up. And, and as I grew a little older, the town grew a little bit, but it was a very close community. We were as vanilla as vanilla could be. Everybody went to church on Sunday in our town, whether it was a Mennonite church or a Baptist church or a Methodist church, you just went to church on Sunday. Everything shut down in our town. Everything was slow moving. And then when I got about 13 years old, we moved south of the river, south of town, and then we moved into the really tough part of the world. We lived in the Catholic community. So down there where I lived, if you crossed the English River, you went into the Christian side that way. If you went to the west and crossed the Highway 1, you went into where the druggies lived. But I lived in the Catholic community and and grew up riding the bus with the Catholic kids. And and our, 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 our town was very segregated and very much if you didn't look like us, you didn't come into our town. So we had, we had nobody of any color in our town. Everybody was a middle class, upper class. Everybody had good family backgrounds. And everybody knew everything about everybody. You just didn't fit in. And then, you know, I eventually grew up and moved away. And then my wife and I lived in eastern Ohio for 18 years. And in, in, in Holmes County, it's probably one of the most racist communities I've ever lived in in my life. And in Holmes County, it's very vanilla very bearded, very suspended, and big hats. Um, and if you're not Amish or Mennonite, you're not going to fit in. It's just that simple. And, and, and again, we had to deal with our prejudices and our racists and our, and our views that we grow up with. And the reality is, is God invites everybody to the table, regardless of their skin color, regardless of anything that is there. And we must repent of our tendencies discriminate to people and begin to reach out to them. And that, that tendency to discriminate is, comes from the pit of hell itself because Satan wants us to separate and segregate and stay away from people, and God invites us to come together and bring them in. So, so Peter was a guy that wrestled with this. No, he did. So in this passage in Acts, he goes and he finally shares with Cornelius and Cornelius' household. You'll see him a little bit. They, grew, they get to know Christ, and God does great wonders in their life. But, but later you read in Galatians, Peter is still struggling with his, with his prejudices. And so Paul shows up where Peter is at, and he confronts him. Now, I don't know about you, but I've read enough of the Gospels to know that I don't want Paul confronting me. They, they tell you by historians that Paul was a little short guy, but he was probably like a little ferret. Like when he started on something, he wasn't about to quit. And he was going to latch on and he was going to let you have it. And so he looks up at Peter and then he says this here. This is from Galatians chapter 2. When Peter came to Antioch, this is Paul speaking, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I can just hear Paul going, 
I opposed him to his face because he was wrong. I mean, it's like talking to your spouse, you know, <laughs> or your parents. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that'll get me in trouble. <laughs> it's really not like, it's like talking to your neighbors. <laughs> not, no, 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 don't see that either. Let's just stop. It, it's one of those phrases that's really strong, okay? And then Peter, go, then John, Paul goes on. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth are, and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have to put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If, while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I, for through the law, I die to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live for Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, Peter, look, stop trying to make people live according to the Jewish customs and the Jewish law and allow them to live in the freedom that comes in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to save us of our sins. We have to move past our prejudices. So here's Peter. Peter wrestled with this. If you remember back in the Old Testament, there was a guy by the name of Jonah. He wrestled with his own prejudices, right? Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, which was an Assyrian city. The Jewish people didn't care for the, the Assyrians. They were not a great people. Peter was over here. He was called to go to the Gentiles, Cornelius' house, and he didn't want to go. So Peter and, Cor and Jonah had a lot of similarities. Both of them had to be converted to the possibilities in God before they can go. Peter had a vision. Three times food came down. Three times he was told to eat. Three times he said no, and then God said, Peter, you... You're just missing it. Jonah, he said no to God. God had to talk to him for three days in the belly of a big fish. But both of them, when God got a hold of them, they said, okay, God, I can move past my prejudices and I can go do what you called me to do. And when both of them went, they both preached a message of salvation and both communities came to know Christ because of that. Think of the possibilities when we move past our prejudices. Whatever our prejudices may be, it can change lives. And so we have to remember that God is in the business of changing lives, and He wants to use us, and He wants us to move past and see people just as how God sees them, as a possibility of being a follower of Jesus Christ, regardless of any other prejudices. The second thing that we need to learn from this passage is that the message is always the same. The message was the same in Peter's day, in Paul's day, in my great, great, great something grandfather's day, in my father's day, in my day, in your day. Go back in history as far as you want. The message is always the same. There's some things we can learn in this passage. I'm just going to kind of go back and touch on some of these things as we read on further in Acts 10. The first one we find in chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Here's what he's saying, is Jesus is Messiah, is Lord of all, regardless of our background. No matter what our background is, Jesus is Messiah, Lord of all. Deuteronomy chapter 10, he says this, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, great and mighty and awesome who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. He's telling us in this passage from, from Deuteronomy, even back in Old Testament, that God is God of all people. He doesn't show favoritism. And as a people, we need to remember that Jesus is Messiah and Lord of all, and He reaches out to every person. The second thing we can learn from this passage we find in verse 35. He says this, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. 
Jesus was empowered by the Spirit of God to liberate all persons that the devil is trying to captivate. Today, God continues to show mercy to anyone who humbles themselves before him. James 4 says it this way. It says, submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Jesus came and he came to liberate everybody, all of us. The third thing we can learn from this passage, we find in verse 36, and he says it this way. He says, you know the message that God sent to the people of Israel telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all? You know what happened throughout Judea? And so what he's telling us is this, is that Jesus is Lord of everything. He is Lord of all. He died under the curse that we all deserve. He died under the separation. He He died so that you and I could be united to God and made new again. In in Philippians chapter 2, it says, He humbled Himself even to the point of death on the cross. But it was there on the cross that God exalted Him to the highest place and gave Him the name that is above all names, in the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess, what? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is Lord of all, and we need to remember that. The message has not changed, right? The next thing we learn in this passage found in 37 and 38, he says, you know what has happened throughout Judea beginning in in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. Jesus lived a spirit-filled life filled with God's presence. He was sent to reign forever and he will. And He reigns today. He reigns for you and He reigns for all of us. It it tells us in a passage we read earlier when when Stephen was being stoned that Jesus is standing at the right hand of the throne of God interceding on our behalf. The next thing we read in verse 39 to 42, it says that the cross is the center of the message, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, and His returning again. He says this way, We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead, and on the third day caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he was rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and of the dead. Jesus Christ is the message, and we can take that with us everywhere we go. And the last thing I want us to get from this that the message does not change is that Jesus is rooted and grounded in God's eternal plan and has always been rooted and grounded. Verse 43 says it this way, all prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. And what he's saying is this, is that throughout all of scripture, everything points to Jesus Christ and everything points to the fact that he has came to make a difference in all of our life. The message is always the same, and we need to take this message with us. The third thing I want us to learn in this passage is that Jesus brings freedom to all. So Luke records what happens, and and after Peter preached this message, if you read on in this passage, uh, verses 44 and 45, we see that that Cornelius' household was filled with the Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit filled them, and God was growing. The message was growing throughout the community. Luke records what happens. It was really the Gentile version of Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter 2. The Spirit was opening a new chapter, and the Gentiles were now being seen as children of Abraham, not through circumcision, but by grace alone, through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Romans 4, one of my favorite passages, says it this way. It says, therefore the promise of faith, therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Not only to those who are of the law, but those who are also the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as has been said to him, so shall your offspring be. The message is that Jesus brings freedom to everyone. He sets us all free. This morning we had baptism for Jonah here. Um, Jonah, you're younger than me. You don't look like me. 
you know, your, your eyes are a little different color than mine. Your, your smile looks a little different than me. Um, you think different things than me because you're younger than me, so you probably listen to music that I don't listen to, you know? You probably drive in a different way than what I do. I mean, I could talk about differences we have all day long. The reality is we got the same father, right? We have the same father. You had, the, you had a shirt on that said step, step brothers. Well, we're not step brothers. We are brothers made the same in Christ, and, and Christ makes us all new and brings freedom to everyone. Galatians 3 says this way, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor male nor female, for we are all one in Jesus Christ. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And that promise was, is you will be blessed and all people and all nations will be blessed through you. So the last thing we need to get from this passage is that we are called to invite others. We're called to invite others to the table. And it's fitting today that we're doing communion because the communion represents the fact that Jesus Christ came to set us free. And this table, this table of freedom that talks about the forgiveness that comes from God, this freedom that talks about, this, this table that talks about all this freedom that we have in Jesus Christ, we're called to invite others. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because of that, I commission you to go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. Our mission statement here at North Clinton comes from a passage in Ephesians chapter 4 that says this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does His work. We're going to sing this song of closing, and I want you to know that God came to make a difference in our life. And he came to ask for all of us, our whole being. And he asked us to take that and share that message of hope and salvation to all those around us. So if you would stand and join us as we sing this song. We need to come out of wherever we have been and move forward in the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ.